Welcome back. So we're going to move into some of the linguistic history that we find during the Middle English time period um, with this lecture. So we'll focus on some syntax, lexicon, and issues of semantics in this lecture. And then the following lectures will focus on phonology and morphology. But we will briefly just go over some of the important features that we find throughout Middle English linguistics. Um, so starting with syntax and what we'll talk about today is that syntax is starting to look more and more like present day English during this time period. We do still see some vestiges of Old English, so there are still object pronouns before the verb, um, but we start seeing indefinite and definite articles begin to be used more commonly, so something that we didn't really see in Old English. And verb phrases are developing into a system that wasn't really featured in Old English either. In terms of lexicon, we start seeing an explosion of loanwords. So early in Middle English, Norse words were found in texts. Later, we see a lot more French and Latin influence, um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of that. With phonology, we start seeing some voice fricatives becoming phonemic. Um, a phonemic length in consonants is lost by the end of the Middle English period, so long consonants versus short continent consonants that we see in Old English are something that we start losing and are completely gone by the end of Middle English. And we start seeing unstressed syllables becoming closer to something like schwa, the uh, or i sounds. Um, and so this is something we'll talk about in the next lecture. And then in the final lecture with morphology, we'll see that there's just a steady loss of inflection during this time period. What we saw with lots of different inflections, lots of different cases and numbers and um, different sort of ways to have weak and strong verbs, we'll see a loss of this very commonly throughout Middle English um, until we start getting closer and closer to present day English um, as these things start going by the wayside. But if we focus on some of the issues with syntax and lexicon today, Middle English syntax is something that is starting to become more rigid than Old English, but still a little bit less rigid than what we see in present day English. So we're starting to see syntax take up what's happening as we're losing inflection and morphology. The rigidity will increase throughout the Middle English period so that by the end of Middle English, by the time we get to early modern English, most of the sentences that you would see <clears throat> are things that you would expect or find as acceptable sentences today. Earlier in the Middle English period, there's still some variation that you wouldn't expect to be able to find in present day English. With noun phrases, there's several things that are happening with, with them. So single word adjectives are typically preceding nouns. This is what happened in Old English. This is what we still do in present day English. Um, the adjective and noun order was occasionally reversed in poetry. This is especially common when you see things translated from French or Latin because that was the order of words in French and Latin. Um, we start seeing the indefinite article a or an. This came from an unstressed variant of the number one. So one um, becoming an or a, and then we see that sort of eroding further until we get to that indefinite article. Titles in Middle English are usually noun and adjectives, so similar to what we see today. So King Richard um, would be something that you would typically find um, when we're talking about that. But in Old English, we saw, often saw the reverse. So Edgar Kuning um, would have king after the name. And this is something that we start seeing changing and becoming more similar to present day English. With Old English and Middle English, when there's multiple modifiers for words, typically one of them preceded it and the rest would follow. This is something we no longer do in present day English. Phrasal modifiers usually followed the words they modified, so this is something we also see in present day English. Um, so the spy who came in from the cold, or the man with the big yellow hat. When you have one of those dependent clauses that's attached to a noun phrase, you see them after the noun that they modify typically. Possessive nouns are usually preceding the words that they modify, um, and during this time there were no apostrophes used, so other men's prosperity. This is the same ordering that we would use today, but now we would start using apostrophes um, for those things like possession. We start seeing the use of of as a possessive as well. This is in parallel to what we what is uh, happening in French. So we start seeing that with something like obligation of mine, rather than just saying my obligation. Um, and we also see some double possessives starting to happen during this time period. They're not terribly common yet, but we start seeing them. So the boy's dog's bone. This is something that we could um, say in present day English. And this is where it starts to happen. We didn't see that in Old English. When we look at other phrases like adverbial phrases, um, these tended to precede the words that they modify more often in Middle English than what we see in present day. So we'll see them more often as something like quickly I ran versus I ran quickly. And remember in present day English, adverbs are still the one word class that's relatively flexible. We can move those around in sentences still today and still have an understanding. So either of those we could hear and see and in present day English and you would understand what was happening, but we're more likely in present day English to use the latter one, I ran quickly rather than quickly I ran.
The negative marker was ne, and this would always precede the verb in Middle English. There were other negative markers that tended to precede verbs as well. And so the present day English placement of negation after an auxiliary verb is also seen. So have not done is something where you'd have the auxiliary and then you would have the negative and then you would have the verb, for instance. We start seeing, or we, we're seeing very frequently in Middle English double negatives used. So this is something that isn't really moved away from uh, standardized English until later in the early modern period. This is something that is relatively natural to the English language is using double negatives. So we see lots of examples in Middle English, um, not told she, the angle, no tail. Um, so we see double negatives where you have this negative concord there, not never yet, no villainy, not said. So you're seeing anytime there is negation that everything has negation attached to it. And this is very common in many languages of the world. Um, this is something that is relatively natural in English and is commonly found in several dialects of English even today. But this is something that we saw very freely used throughout the Middle English time period. There really wasn't any attempt to try to change that or correct that until we get to the early modern period. We start seeing prepositions increase during this time as well. So prepositions will normally precede their objects. And occasionally in Middle English, they'll follow objects, especially if the object is a pronoun. Something we don't really see in present day English, but did still see in Middle English, is that prepositions will be seen after an object if the object is a relative pronoun or in passive constructions. So if we look at these examples, um, you'll notice that the asterisk means that we can't say this in present day English. The question mark means that in some cases you might hear someone say it and in some dialects it might not be acceptable any longer. Um, so in the relative clauses, you would say the place that I have speak, that would be a normal way of doing it in Middle English. We can't really say that in present day English. Um, precious stones that he could buy a kingdom with. I would be able to say that. Some of you may find that something acceptable and some of you may find that that would not be as acceptable. And then the passive construction, these other words of this bishop ought, ought to be taken heed to. Um, so having the two at the end there um, is something that some dialects today might still allow, but others might not. So we see some questionable acceptability for some of these that were standardly found um, or commonly found in Middle English. With verb phrases during the Middle English time period, we start seeing more compound verb phrases and become common. Um, so we, especially with things like the perfect aspect, so have seen, has seen. Um, this is very rare in Old English, but it's becoming much more common in Middle English, even though we don't yet have a fixed word order from it. We're also starting to see be and have starting to be used as auxiliary verbs. Um, so the helping verb, so I am going, um, I have gone, those kinds of things um, would be examples of using those as auxiliaries. We get an introduction of the progressive aspect, the sort of ing um, ending. You find this in some cases in Middle English, we're not really sure exactly where it started, um, but it starts showing up during the Middle English time period, but not really fully developed. We don't see it very commonly, but it is starting to be seen occasionally during this time. And we also see some of other um, more complex phrasal verbs. So a perfect infinitive um, to have held um, is something that we start seeing later in the uh, Middle English period. And we start seeing combinations of this towards the very end of the Middle English period. So as we'll see in early modern English, a lot of these different phrasal verbs start becoming very common. We start getting much more complex constructions in our verbs. Um, but we're starting to see that at the end of Middle English, but it's not really common um, during this time period yet. We do also start seeing um, the use of things like shall and will to start expressing future. So when I say I will go tomorrow, um, that's starting out, that's something that we're starting to see um, using more commonly in Middle English. Um, we start seeing by as a preposition for indicating agency in a passive. So if we make a passive construction, so the bowl was knocked over by the dog, um, that would be an example of a passive and using by to say who's doing it. Um, we start seeing more modal verbs in Middle English as well. So this is something that's characteristic of a lot of analytical languages. So as English has moved from being something that has a lot of inflection to losing that inflection and becoming more analytical, modal verbs are expected to become more common. And we see that starting to happen um, during this time period as well. We also start seeing what are sometimes called quasi-modals or sort of phrasal modals. So be going like I am going to do something or I am about to do something um, are things that we start seeing in the Middle English time period as well. We're still seeing subjunctive used for in Middle English to express things like optative and hypothetical meanings. So optative would be expressing expressing a wish. Um, so if only something happened 
Um, we don't really see subjunctive very commonly in present day English. It's still around. Some people still use it. I still use subjunctive occasionally. But you'll notice that it's not used nearly as commonly in present day English as what we're still seeing in Middle English. When we get to the clause level, you'll notice that Old English allowed pretty much any possible option of ordering within their clauses. There were still some favorites, so there were still things that are still familiar to us in present day English, um, though the more prominent subject object verb construction in Old English is something that we see start changing during this time period, where Middle English will continue some of these Old English patterns, but the trend is starting to move us closer to what we see in present day. So by the end of Middle English, we have a pretty firmly established word ordering of subject, verb, and object. Um, but the Middle English period, we see a lot of variation and a lot of change as that's happening and sort of switching from more flexibility to by the end of Middle English, much less flexibility where that SVO ordering is what you would expect to see pretty much everywhere. The SVO construction, so subject, verb, object, is found in independent clauses during this time. It's found after adverbials during this time in things like dependent clauses, some um, indirect questions, so people asked her how she could live. Um, and we see some other constructions more in specific contexts. So subject, object, verb is still found when a pronoun is an object. So if a man wants to harm you, um, it would look like if a man will you harm. Independent clauses, we see this, so that you this work not in neglect. Um, so you see a slightly different ordering of that where the object goes in front of the verb. And in some compound tenses, we see this as well. So who has you in the well put instead of who has put you in the well um, is something that we still see in Middle English. And we see some other of those variations in clause order in Middle English in specific contexts as well. So verb, subject, and object will sometimes still be used in direct questions or imperatives. So gave you the child anything rather than have you given the child anything? Um, or what say we also of them that delight themselves in swearing? Um, so we're seeing that the verb can sometimes go at the beginning in some cases. And we will sometimes also see object, subject, verb, where you're emphasizing what the direct object would be. So this book I have made and written. And we can still kind of use some of those kinds of contexts um, in present day English, but we don't really see them very commonly. And this was still a pretty common word order. So merchant he was in his youth. You wouldn't really hear that in that order today, but this was something that you would commonly see during Middle English. We also see the introduction of dummy subjects in Middle English, where another remedy there is against sloth. So rather than putting the subject back there and saying the exact same thing, we have these dummy subjects um, that are very common in our everyday language today, but we see them starting to become introduced during the Middle English time period. And then a few other syntax features. Um, if we're looking at sentences, Old English, um, did this as well, and Middle English also favored uh, cumulative sort of run-on sentences rather than periodic independent sentences where you have a sentence, a period, a sentence, a period. We still see a lot of run-on sentences where you have multiple clauses sort of just running together without any sort of break in the same way. And so they're easy to understand, but they appear inelegant to us today because we're used to having those um, independent clauses where there's you know one main verb and then you have a period, one main verb and then you have a period. We don't really see that as often in Middle English. In poetry, we're starting to see um, some changes where there's the same ordering of things generally in poetry as we see in uh, regular Middle English phrases and clauses, though we see some inversions where things are switched around. Um, and the complexity of structures um, that are in poetry will vary as well. So in the general prologue of Canterbury Tales, which we'll see um, some examples of in this class, um, has some inversion. Um, but syntax was relatively ambiguous. So the 18 li lines um, will comprise a single sentence of 11 clauses. We don't actually see an independent clause until line 12. So you see lots of run-ons, um, lots of variation, not a lot of um, <clears throat> set in stone syntax ordering like what we would expect today. When we move on to thinking about the lexicon and the words we're seeing, this was a time that there was a lot of change in our lexicon. There was a great deal of lexicon introduced during this time period. We're getting lots and lots and lots of new words very, very frequently. And a lot of this is coming from French during that diglossic situation during this time period. And this is a common thing to have where there's one language that's in more power and another language in less power. The language that has less social power will often borrow words from the language in power um, because they're using those words to sort of communicate but they're still maintaining the same general grammatical structures of their native language. So we'll see that commonly happen. Um, and so this is why many of our words um, 
from Old English get replaced in Middle English with French words. We just see an explosion of new words being brought in as well. And English have become pretty well suited for borrowing words. We borrow words from languages all the time. Um, and this is especially becoming easier during Middle English because we're, in, we're simplifying that inflectional system. So rather than having to figure out where do I put a new word, do I put it as masculine or feminine or neuter if it's a noun, as everything is sort of falling by the wayside and we're losing those inflectional distinctions, it makes it a lot easier to borrow words in because we don't have to decide where they're going to go in the system. We can just add them in and the endings are going to be the same regardless. We also see compounds helping form a lot of new words. Middle English is starting to find more creative ways to compound things than what we often saw in Old English. So compounding, affixing is a very common way to, for Middle English to create new words, just as we see in language today, just as we see in many other languages throughout the world. These are very common ways to create new words as well. And this made it a lot easier to compound things as we lost inflection, but then it kind of becomes a little bit more difficult to decide, well, what is the element of the compound? So in something like windfall, is this a noun and a noun, or is this a noun and a verb? You kind of have to, you're not entirely sure because you don't have any of those inflectional markers um, included in there. Some examples of some compounds that we start finding in Middle English are things like noun and noun, so cheesecake, toadstool. We see things like adjectives and nouns, sweetheart, wildfire. Adverbs plus nouns, so this is where we get some of our time uh, nouns, so insight, afternoon. Nouns and verbs, sunshine, nosebleed verbs and nouns, so in these different orderings, so hangman, pastime. These are all things that are starting to become common in Middle English. Verbs plus adverbs, so runabout, lean to, and also adverbs and verbs, outcome, outcast. These are all things that we're able to compound in Middle English that we don't really see previously in the Old English time period. Other compounds are things that we can see with other word classes as well. So we start getting some compound adjectives where we can add a noun and an adjective together and get an adjective such as threadbare, blood red, headstrong. Um, we less commonly see an adjective and a noun becoming an adjective, but something like every day would be an example of that. We start seeing some compound verbs as well. So an adverb plus a verb would give us outline, uphold, overturn. A noun and a verb can create a verb like manhandle. And we start seeing some back formations starting to come out, um, but not as commonly as we would see until early modern English. So things like babysit from babysitter wouldn't really be common until early modern English, but we're starting to see some examples of that starting to be allowed in Middle English time. And then there's lots of loan words that we get um, in compounds or phrases um, that are treated as just a single word in English. So the French word um, pork espine, so spiny pig, becomes porcupine. Latin dies mali, evil days, becomes dismal. So taking two words um, that we sort of compound together from another language and then create just one single word out of it once it's borrowed into English. We also see lots of affixation happening. So there were some Old English affixes that are just completely lost. So then ed prefix um, to mean again was replaced by re, so coming from Latin. Um, others were um, l as in foreign or im for around. We don't really see those any longer. And then some of them sort of survived but lost their productiveness. So we don't really see them as often. So the hood in something like motherhood, we don't see in very many instances like anymore. The for in something like forsake or forswear, the with and withstand um, are things that we still had in Old English that we still have today, but that are sort of limited in what we can add them to. And then we start seeing lots of new prefixes borrowed from French and Latin that we didn't have in Old English. So we're starting to see a lot more affixation in terms of der uh, derivational affixes, things that will change or create new words that we didn't really have in Old English. And we lost a lot of vocabulary from Old English during this time as well. So a lot of French and Norse words became unnecessary, so they also disappeared that it, they were common in Middle English, but we didn't really need them. We may have borrowed some in and then also lost them during this period. Um, and most of the lexical loss in Old English was due to French loan words, but not always. Sometimes we just didn't need a word or sometimes we just replaced it. So we replaced spider from a, a to copa. Um, body was switched out often, neck, these are different words where you see the Old English equivalent and we just don't use those any longer. So sometimes we just replaced a word, sometimes we borrowed a new word in and the Old English word was no longer necessary, um, and then other times we just lost it because it wasn't needed anymore, it wasn't useful for us. And then when we think about some semantic changes
briefly. The meanings of words from Old English into Middle English were changed as well, and it's harder to treat these things systematically because they tend to change more sporadically than uh, systematically when we're thinking about individual words and the meaning changes that we see. And uh, this will change from one dialect to another, and so this can complicate this as well. And there's some lack of written evidence from Old English um, to know exactly what the meaning would have been previously to how the meanings have changed over time. So we have some limited examples, but we we don't always know exactly how much of that has changed um, as we're looking through some of the meaning changes over time. But if we look at some of these changes, you'll notice that some of the most common types of change is to generalize or narrow the meaning of a word. Um, and this is the easiest one to observe between Old English and Middle English, except especially with the influx of loan words, because we can see what something was used for in Old English and what it starts being used for um, in uh, the Middle English time period. So yoma, or goma, jaw, palate, or inside of the mouth. Um, so this is where we get uh, Latin loan words. And then the new word jaw narrows down, we get gum out of goma. And so we have new words that are coming in to sort of take the place of some of that meaning. So goma only means gum now, instead of all of these other areas that are inside of your mouth. In Old English, sand could mean sand, it could also mean shore. Uh, the low German word shore was borrowed to mean land along a body of water, and sand ended up narrowing to just mean the specific pieces that you might find at the shore, those granular particles, particles of rock. So we don't really call a shoreline sand any longer, even though in Old English you would have been able to use that. Generalization is not as common, but we do see this occasionally. So in Old English, brid meant young bird, and we now use this as a general term for bird. Um, where it's the general term for bird, fowl got more narrow. So the Middle English word bird generalizes to fowl of any age, and then fowl narrows down to just the kinds of birds that we eat. So we're seeing a little bit of a combination of generalization and narrowing there. And then a couple others are what are known as amelioration or sort of increasingly positive and pejoration or an increasingly negative meaning. These ones are harder to decide and harder to pinpoint. So in Chaucer saying so crafty and so sly, crafty is coming from Old English for strong or skillful or, or clever. By Middle English, we're seeing crafty and sly used in somewhat negative terms. Um, so, and we can still see that today where it's calling someone crafty isn't necessarily a nice thing. Um, but we see other times where um, amelioration or a nicer meaning could come out of it as well. So dizzy in Old English meant foolish or dumb. By Middle English, this is referring to what it means today, so thinking about vertigo. And then we also get some strengthening and weakening. So generally, words tend to weaken in meaning more than they strengthen. So the word awe in Old English is something that we can use for um, a lot of different things. Like we can say, oh, that's awesome, and not necessarily mean the same kind of power that it had in Old English, um, where it was meaning terror or dread. And by Middle English, it turned into more of a reverential fear and respect. And now we can use it to refer to anything that we find interesting in some way. And so the weakened meaning will suggest that these uh, fears of unworldly things are not as strong as the immediate worldly fears. And eventually over time, we also see that it can just start being used in generally positive ways um, that have sort of weakened in power over time. So that gives you an idea of some of the meaning changes, the lexical changes, the syntax changes in Middle English. We'll talk through some of these examples in class as well. If you have questions, send an email, schedule office hours, bring questions to class, and we'll be able to talk about them.